Every individual has a story, a mixture of scars and victories. No one can ever be fully prepared for life. No one can ever be prepared for the twist of fate. Coming to you on Your Women Radio 91.7, join Tong Shania as she engages the ones bold enough to bear it all. Only on Tong Talks, 5 p.m. every last Sunday of the month. died uh, with no will in test state. Emmanuel was 58 years old when he passed, leaving behind uh, his wife and two children, his parents, two sisters, and one brother, who are all married. Emmanuel was a family man with homes and thriving businesses in, in Nigeria. He loved his wife, and uh, he was fond of his parents. <coughs> Sorry, I've, I've got a cough. <coughs> fond of his parents and his, uh, <coughs> and his siblings. And uh, weeks after his uh, sudden death, his family, his siblings, uh, his wife, they disagreed on almost everything before the funeral. On almost everything before the funeral. <laughs> it was messy, very, very messy. And today, uh, Emmanuel's wife um, um, and family are no longer on good terms. Emmanuel did not put plans in place because it was a lie. And this is why the family are no longer on good terms. So this is a true life story because Emmanuel's sister and wife are my friends. And Emmanuel's sister said to me, Tom, if only Emmanuel had a will, we will all be living in peace. My name is Tom Okewali Shonaya. And what I am doing here today is not to condemn, but to allow life lessons to shape our choices and perspectives, to allow life lessons to improve our relationships and make living beautiful. I have seen many situations when a loved one dies and did not put things in place. Bitterness sets in. Anger. Sometimes regrets. And the people you are supposed to love most when you are alive, they are fighting and they are resentful. So today I have with me Tara and we will uh, talk about living in peace, peacefully, when you lose a loved one, with or without a will in place. Tara and I went to the same secondary school. Um, Tara and I went to the same secondary school in Bida, Niger State. Tara lost her husband, uh, and uh, Tara's husband did not do a will, but Tara had a will. Tara had a focus, and Tara had a mission possible. And so today, Tone talks with Tara. Tara, I know the network has been in and out. <laughs> You've been in and out. How are you? Are you there? Okay. So network has not been too fantastic, and, and um, hopefully Tara will, will join us soon. So Tara lost her husband, right? And um, Tara also happens to be a legal person. She lost her husband. Her husband didn't do a will. He didn't do any will at all. And one of the things I remember asking Tara um, is, Tara, were you agitated? You know, did you think the family would meddle? You know, and, and all of those. So, Tara, thank you very much for coming on. 
Um, thanks a lot, Tara. I just mentioned that. Um, Tara, please put your video off. <clears throat> I just mentioned that um, so that we can have a fantastic net, um, network. You can put the video off. So I'll just mention that uh, you, you know, your husband didn't do a will, um, but that you had a focus and you had a mission and the mission was possible. So Tara, tell me, you know, how are you today? Well, I'm good. Thank you first what? for having me on the show. And oh, I am good. Very, very Thank good. You. <laughs> Thank you. What, what what's happening to the network now? What is what is up? <laughs> I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I know. You you've been in and out now. You've yes, been I in was, and out. So I'm wondering what is the another, problem? I was using another device and I was getting a call, so I switched over to my ah, iPhone. Ah, I see. I see. <laughs> I see. Thank you. You know you iPhone people. I always tell Taiwan Esther. Arrogant people. You want us to know you are using <laughs> iPhone. My dear Samsung is the best. I know they will tell me that I'm not supposed to advertise. <laughs> so Tara, your husband did not write a will when he passed on. No, he didn't. Can you can you tell me why he chose not to write a will? Hmm. I think it's the normal reluctance of of human beings actually when we don't want to come face to face with our mortality. You know, the oh, thing with the fact that you think you will live forever, the fact that even though you might be ill, you have the hopes that, you know, you would live forever and that making a will could be like a death wish and, uh, you know, incur the wrath of God or your faith or is against your faith and your hopes to, to live. And also, you know, just the reluctance, you know, to come to terms with our mortality. But I think also it was also because um, I think he, in a way, he trusted me. He trusted that oh. well, I, would, I was able to um, sort things out because on the other day we had a conversation and he said, oh, you know, you'll be all right, Sarah. You can live without me and you can, you are strong. You will do all that you need to do you know, without me being in the picture. And I think also he knew the kind of family that, you know, he came from and that um, they wouldn't um, disturb me in any way or give me any troubles, you know. So, they, and then the, uh, most of the assets we had were both in our joint names. So I think that assured him a bit that whatever happened, you know, um, I could take over the assets. Thank you very much, Tara. So you you, you see, you, I, I find it a, a little bit, um, what is the word now, a little bit confusing. If you're saying that he trusted you, because trust is a very important thing that we will talk about later. So if he trusted you, why not do a will then? Why, well, because not, why not? Because a will, a will would, would make him face his, mortal, immortal, his mortality. And that's basically why most people don't do it. It's not because they don't trust people, but because if they do a will, they, they think they're going to die. And nobody wants ah. to die. They all want to go to heaven. <laughs> ah. Ah. So you see, at this point in time, Tara, I want us to acknowledge that there is a cultural notation. And men do have fears that may prevent them from writing a will. You just said it. So let us take the fears, let's take the fears of men into consideration. And and the good thing is I have invited some male friends and family to listen and for them to hear what may likely happen to their loved ones when the man is gone, with or without a will. So the objective for me is to look at the reality of having a will. And if you choose not to have a will, like your husband chose not to have a will, what should the man do to protect his loved ones? So, Tara, what did your husband put in place since he did not do, he did not write a will? What are those things to put in place to protect you and the children and his family, you know, and, as well? Okay, but I think the first thing that he did, and really I was the one that initiated it, you know, I, I went to, you said earlier that we went to the same secondary school. So a friend of mine, you know, in secondary school, she was my classmate. Her husband died, and it was quite tragic. They had waited for like 15, 16 years before having children. They had a set of twins. They had just been maybe one year old, and then she was pregnant again with the third child. And the husband went for a routine um, appendicitis um surgery and even before they did the surgery he reacted badly to the um 
gas, the anesthesia, and he died and he passed off. And when we went to visit him, he's, um, I, I, I been very pragmatic because I am pragmatic about that. You know, told us, uh, okay, so finances, what's going to happen? Because she had three, two small children and at that time she was pregnant and she put out his two phones and said huh, that she doesn't even know the passwords. You know, the phones were passworded and she didn't know them. Hmm. That was one thing. Okay, do you do you know his ATM um, pin numbers? She said yes, she knew his ATM pin numbers, but she didn't have his internet banking details. So I said, okay, there was a friend of ours, another classmate that stayed close to her. So I said, you're supposed to be mourning, but for this course, she would you will go with your our friend to the ATM. We would confirm the balance in the bank, you know, in his account, and then we would start to remove money. But you know, you, you can't do more than two hundred thousand or so, you know, with the ATM transfers. But that's what happened, you know. For and when we were going home, I told all the girls that we were with me. And by that time, my husband had been diagnosed of a cancer, you know, and. I said, you know what, we shouldn't find ourselves in this situation if anything happens. And I told everybody, please go and go and go and get know what you know the assets your husband have and all that. And when I go to my I talked to my husband about it, he said, mm, okay. You know, so I said, Well, I know your PIN numbers. I don't know your internet banking and all that, you know. So what would we do, you know? He brushed it aside, you know, and just we went about. But that thought kept, kept lingering in my mind. And so one day, I told him, you know what? I've asked you for all your details, but you didn't want to give it to me. So I'm going to put down all my details. So I got a piece of paper, and I put down everything, my bank, internet banking details, my ATM pins, my Yahoo mail, um passwords and all that and i put it down and i said i put down my own now would you put yours down and he did so so we, um after i did so i put it in a drawer in the cabinet in our room and that was it and when he died that was what i went to oh tara thank you so much for that you know, I picked up a few things. You were pragmatic about death. <laughs> it's like you were prepared for it. A lot of people are not prepared for it. A lot of men are not, a lot of women are not prepared for it. And certainly our men are not prepared for it. So you knew your husband was dying, Tara. Did that help you to plan well? I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Because sometimes death, as I said, is sudden. Women are mostly at the receiving end when the husband is dead. She's the first suspect. And you mm -hmm. hear things like, how did he die? When? Mm -hmm. And where were you when he died? What happened? What, what did he eat? Where did he go? Pressures from all quarters. Mm -hmm. so, so the question now is, did knowing your husband was going to die, did he help you to plan? Did he help you to prepare better in terms of, of course, the financial burden, your future, and that of the children? Well, first of all, I didn't know he was going to die <laughs> because uh, oh. even at the point he died, you know, um, nobody knew he was going to die because a week to that time, it was all, all, all about the place, you know. But knowing that he had a terminal disease which could lead to death, you know, made okay. death cross my mind, you know, several years. Of course, I tried to brush it away, you know. So, um, but after after his death, I've come to the fact that, you know, people die of all ages, whether you are young, whether you're old, whether you're middle aged. So we must, and I started to talk about that a lot, you know, that we must think about that. It, it really is part of living. For a, for a tree to grow, the seed must die. So we shouldn't we should be afraid of death. And we must have those conversations. I remember that also, my husband, you know, even before, I think when he, was, when he was first diagnosed, you know, um, we started to have those conversations about it. What would you like? What would you do? You know, what what would... And he never brought up those conversations. I was not, I always brought them up, you know, because I just knew that I had to protect myself and protect my children if anything happened. So I think that most people, you know, 
should bring them up. Whether you the person has a terminal disease or not, we should be able to talk about that. It's the elephant in the room. And a lot of times we do not talk about it. So when it comes, it, it, it meets us on our way. And it shouldn't be. Because the more we talk about life, the more we should also look out for death because it's going to come. Well, so, so Tara, you know, uh, you, and this is why I, I, every time I've spoken to you, every time I have the opportunity to chat with you, I'm always saying that you inspire me and I respect you a lot. Because, like you said, de thank you, Tara, death is part of living. And we must have this conversation. We must talk about death. You know, you know, um, I've had very, very, very close friends who have lost uh, their husbands or lost lost their wives. Um, mm. A friend of mine, um, the wife had cancer, and within, within three months, six six days to their daughter's wedding, she passed oh. on in six oh. days. So the oh. husband, who is my friend, had to. You know, go through that wedding, take the, you know, he took, he took the role and, and he was, and he kept on saying to me, Tom, I wasn't even prepared. So you, you just said we must talk about it. Um, we must have these conversations. Um, death is part of living. So what should the wife do if he chooses not to have a will? Because, um, you know, you spoke to me uh, sh this earlier this morning and you said, oh, sometimes a will, may, will can be good and it can be positive, it can be negative. And I'm hoping that you can, and that was shocking to me because I thought if there is a will, you know, at least everybody is taken care of, you know. So what should the wife do if the husband chooses not to have a will? Because when a woman mentions the discussion, about her husband's will, you know, it is usually swept under the carpet. And the woman is sometimes tagged as desperate or even assumed to be planning her husband's death. Some do not even some do not even bring these conversations up at all. <laughs> Absolutely. But the woman from a polygamous home, it, it's even more intense because there are other women, there are other children, extended family business associates. So the question is, what should you do while your partner is alive? How should the woman go about this? What should she ask for? Or what should be put in place when he is still alive? Okay. So first of all, I think um, what a woman should do is, one, get maybe an account, a, 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 a joint account. You know, if it's not amenable to will, maybe you might be amenable to a joint account. And a joint account, not a signatory. A lot of people mistake um, being signatory to their husband's account or their wife's account as having the mandate when the person dies. A signatory to their account will, that, that mandate or that authority lapse when the person, when the owner of the account dies. So being a signatory to the account doesn't really stand for much because when the man dies, that, that uh, mandate has lapsed. Also, having a joint account de depends on what kind of mandate you, know, um, you give the bank. So if, for example, you have a joint account and any, either of you who sign of that account, then when the man dies, you can control the account. But if it's both of you must sign you know, for that, to pay that account, then it's almost as good as not being a joint holder of the account. Because when the man dies, the mandate dies with him. You can't sign for his own part. You have to get letters of probate for that. Another thing um, women can do is advise your husband, for example, to have a living trust. And a living trust is an arrangement where the settler Give the trustee the right to hold and manage his assets for the benefit of a person or a person. So what that means is that the man puts his assets. It can either be revocable, it can be irrevocable. He puts his assets in the hands of the trust company most often. And we, we have quite a number of trust companies in Nigeria. And one person that has done that successfully, you know, Ganifa Wayne, you know, put his assets in the hands of the trust trust company. Now, 
what a trust will do for you that a will will not do is that it can help you administer that asset while you are alive. You can oversee it, so to speak. You know, so everybody knows what you have, you know, and everybody knows how you want to manage it. And the, the, mo the beautiful thing about it is that you can change things around in your lifetime while you're still alive and see how what works and what will not work for you. Oh. Another thing also is that you can, uh, your husband can give you what, especially for those in, from polygamous homes, he can give you what he wants to give you during his lifetime. Oh. And do a good of it. You know? So, okay, you don't want to do a will, but you know that we, you, I have co-wives, and you know you have adult children that might be troublesome. So please, can you give me what you want to give me in your lifetime so that everybody knows it? And I'll tell you the story of a friend of mine that her father did that. He did a will, quite all right, when he was 70, and he called all his children. He had children from four different women, and he called them, and he read out what he wanted to put in his will to them, and said, anybody that was not satisfied with it to come and meet him, you know, and then he will explain better, you know, why he did the things he did. But for the children of the first wife who were older, he gave them some properties, but he told them that you will get these properties because the children of the last wife who were then in the early years in secondary school, that it was the profit from the rent of that uh, property that he was going to use to train those children, you know, and he did that. He was 85 this year. And he called his, last year rather, and he called his children again and said, look, okay, the last of my children have graduated. You can all go into your properties. So you can do so, such things in your lifetime. If you don't, if you think um, things are going to, to be terrible or ugly for the wife. So a woman can advise her husband, you know what? Just do what you need to do for me during the light, your, uh, your lifetime, and then you know we move on from that. So there, there, it, it depends on each situation and each circumstance, and but we can be very creative about uh, different um, circumstances and scenarios. Working with the man, knowing the man, and knowing what might be um, amiable to him, you know, as you present it. And lastly, what I always say: a woman must have her own. You must, you must be able to stand, you know, um, firmly, financially, you know, to some extent, you know, so that if your husband dies, you can take up your, the responsibilities and do the things that you need to do. Tara, thank you very much. Tom talks with Tara on uh, Women Radio 91.7. My name is Tom Okewale Shunaya, and I have with me Tara. Tara is a schoolmate. We went to the same secondary school uh, together in Bida Niger State. Um, Tara is a widow. Her husband did not put a will together. He didn't write a will. Um, but, you know, um, that has not affected Tara in any way at all. They planned. They were, they were plans. They put plans in place. Tara, you spoke about joint account. And it's yeah. also good for uh, that you, edu you, you know, you kind of educated us that Having a joint account does not mean you are a signatory. So you were, you were kind of explaining the things that women need to do, you know, um, when the husband doesn't want to do a will. You spoke about the living trust, the one um, late Ghani Fayumi did during his life, li li lifetime. Um, so I have a comment here, and, and it says, at what stage should I... That's the wife. This is a this is a wife. At what age stage should I bring up the discussion of will with my husband? Is he at an early stage of marriage or later years? Did you hear me, Tara? Yes, I did. At any stage, okay. every stage, at later or earlier, because who told you that you will have ten years of marriage? Who told you that you will have one year of marriage? Oh. So I think it's one of the things that we should start to talk about when you have these counselings. Once you start having assets. You know, you should have a will. And wills really are not even just for assets. They are, you could, therefore, once you have, start having children, you should have a will. Because 
you you'll be able to put that there who you want as your children's guidance how you want your children's education to be and stuff like that so it's not only until you have a, a piece of land in banana island or you are 12 25 years in marriage that you should start you know talking about having a will as soon as you get married start having assets you should have a will thank you tara so um my producer miracle said um can i ask you to just break it down for the average uh my, my auntie mama boni right in Abeokuta, she 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 sells um uh you know soft drinks and uh, i i also have uh, we, you know friends in the market who sell pepper they may not really understand what we're talking about assets and uh, what have you so miracle wants you to break it down for the average market woman mm-hmm. right the average market woman okay mm-hmm. what how does she need to plan she may not understand asset or will but what mm-hmm. does she need to do can we break it down for that woman at the grassroots le- level who did not understand the kind of financial knowledge we're talking about okay, okay so what once you have a child for example and you want to plan for that child's future and you have the knowledge though that you might not be around for that child's lifetime for whatever reasons you know you start to think of how you can plan a future for that child the first thing i would i would actually think of which i didn't do but which it's it's a very good investment is a life insurance scheme for that child maybe when that child is 18 you know some amount of money is going to be put aside you know, um, and you know, you get some money from the insurance company. So you could do, you can show the child's life, and that you know that okay. When the child is eighteen, you know, when you get that money, it goes for university education or something. You know, you could also buy. We're talking to the we're talking to the market woman now that wants to plan for a child. Yes. So you yes. you could also um, get like an account for that child. You could. Or your husband and you could get that account for that child and put in money for that child. And there, there's something called the education trust fund too that could help you train that child. You get a trust company, you pay them money, and the they pay the school fees of the child. And it's ensured to some point that when if anything happens to you, that child's education will continue. Am I making it elementary enough? Oh, uh, you're trying. <laughs> <laughs> you are trying. No, actually, you are you are you are trying. Honestly, the life insurance uh, bit um, is is quite good, and uh, knowing that uh, they can also put a few things in place. But you know, I'm just wondering. You see, a lot of uh, there was a time we were talking to women about uh, insurance, and they just said, "Ah, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just paying, 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 paying. I have not fallen sick." I, 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 I can't, I've spent for three years now, and that is not come. And all the money I've spent for three years now is just gone down the drain. How else do you think we can? Um, and actually, you do find women who are educated saying that as well. How else um, but, but can we? The thing about oh, insurance, the thing about insurance is that uh, yes, you pay the premiums, but mm-hmm. so for some people, it's the, even the offices that pay the premiums. For some of us that are professionals, like I know that the MBA, for example, takes part of my practicing fee and I have a life insurance with um, um, an insurance company that if anything happens to me, so if I have paid my practicing fee, you know, I I, I would, um, my beneficiaries will get some money. Not even that, even associations, our association, for example, our school association has a life insurance for members. The thing about life insurance is that you p- bypass probate. Once the beneficiary is an adult, you know, even if he's not an adult, if you can have a guardian that can stand, you know, for him or as an account, they will pay. You don't have to go through probate at all. It's one of the easiest ways of getting money. Tara, 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 bypass probate. Please let me break it down. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you have life insurance, for example, uh-huh. inevitable happens. And you, 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 when you, when you have life insurance, you have a form. You always fill a form, and you have your beneficiaries. You have your next of kin, people that they can contact if anything happens to you. Now, if the inevitable happens, your beneficiaries, the stated beneficiaries in that policy statement, takes your death certificate to the insurance company and says, oh, this person is dead. They do their investigations and they pay immediately. They don't tell you to go and get a will. They don't tell you to go and get um, a probate or anything. They pay based on that policy statement. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. It's uh, half past five. Um, Tone talks with Tara on Women Radio 91.7. I've, I've had about four messages now, and I just quickly want to mention that if anybody wants to send a message to us, please do so at WFM 917 on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, um, yes, and on YouTube, you can drop your message as well. Thank you. Um, at some point in time, I'm going to bring in... Um, uh, another friend of mine, Tara, we mentioned this because yes. I also want us to look at uh, how this works with our Muslims, um, Muslim brothers and sisters. But I have this message from um, Amina. Amina said, how does, because, and I think this, 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 is, this is very, very true. How does one deal with a, a husband that does not want to share information about his asset or about anything with his wife? There are men. Who do not want to share anything? I mean, you know, your story is, is is a story of good one. There's trust. You were able to do things together. But there are men who do not want to share. And there are women too. I mean, we've seen instances of um, of um, of women who, when they pass away, when they pass on, you know, they, they are wealthy and uh, they, they really do things for their husband. And that's the only man. And they live with the husband. So uh, Amina is saying that there are husbands who are secretive when it comes to things like this. They don't share information about their assets. Um, what 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 should women do with that? About I, that? Think, I think we should talk to the men directly because one thing about not sharing your assets when you're gone is that your hard work goes to waste. We have heard that there are quite a number of unclaimed billions in bank accounts lying fallow in the accounts in the banks in Nigeria. And why is that? Because most of those people that had that, those monies didn't divulge information about those monies to their loved ones. So nobody even knew, knows that they, they, they had the money. So I think basically we should talk to the men. This is what happens when... You die, and sometimes we don't even have to talk to them because they see it. You know, family goes after when people die, they come with their promises. You know, for the first one week, two weeks, once the body is in the ground, most people forget. Do you want your your children, you know, to be subjected to their mother having to beg around, you know, for them to be able to eat? Even if you did a will, you know, the time between when it takes. You know, when you do the will, the reading of the will, probating that will, they, because you have to have a lot of money in the bank account to be able to even get the will, uh, get the will probated and get letters of probate, even if you did a will. So do you want your family to really suffer? Those are, those are the questions we have to ask the men. Do you want them to go through your children having to go, you know, drop out of school because they can't pay the fees? I think when we start to have have those discussions with the men, then maybe they would see why they need to divulge um, information or why they even have to do things. And you don't have to tell um, your wife or your children that you're making a will, for example. No, nobody needs to know. You don't need to, nobody needs to know that you've put things in place. But when you die, people will now say, oh, you've made provision for this, you've made provision for that. And you have maybe your lawyer or whoever that comes to to the family and says, oh, this man made a will and this is the will. So you don't have to, you don't have to tell anyone, your wife, for example, that you've done a life insurance, you know, until you die. And then the insurance company gets in touch with her she sees the policy statement. It's better that you that involve them and diverge the information, but it's worse if you don't divulge the information and you don't even prepare at all. And what you know, you just say, Oh, I've lived my life, everybody can 
can live their lives. It, it doesn't work. Okay. I think men ought to understand the implications of not not doing stuff. And then when they understand that implication, they will do it, I believe. Thank, thank you, Tara. Thank you, Tara. Um, um, Tony talks with Tara um, on, on um, you know, death, basically, will. Whether you do a will or you don't will, or you don't do a will, what happened? We're live streaming on YouTube at uh, WFM. 917. Please feel free to drop your messages there. Um, Auntie Bosse Ivonsi, thank you very much. You said this is very informative and relevant. We should encourage women to own properties in their name and children. Women should prioritize and be intentional about owning properties. Tara, I want to quickly talk about um, the story of a Christie, right? Mm. And, and after that, I'm going to bring Halima on, and then I'll come back to you. So, Christie's husband, listen to this. Christie's husband does not trust his siblings. So, he has brothers and sisters, and he has parents. He does not trust. This is, this is a true life, right? Because he's, I, I have the message in front of me here. Christie's husband does not trust his siblings. Mm. And he said, if anything should happen to him, his wife should move all the assets first and the few properties. And she should not be crying. You know, the first thing we do, women, is that because when you said you were very pragmatic about death, I thought of Christy. You know, a woman will be crying and be wailing and what have you. But her <laughs> husband, Christy's husband has, because he's my friend, I know him. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, I've put things in, a lot of things in her, in her name, okay? Mm -hmm. And... I don't trust my siblings, right? Mm. Even though he takes care of his siblings. Yeah. They're, not, they're not hungry. He takes yeah. care of them. They're good. They're okay in their own way. He said, I don't trust them. So I've asked her, move all assets and the few properties. She has mm. access to his bank account. Christy mm. has access to her husband's login details, his mm. ATM pins. She has mm. information about his investments, his shares, and mutual funds. Because he does not trust his siblings. He said, if anything happens, my dear, I don't want to hear you crying, you know, just <laughs> move everything. I mean, I would like to ask you, yeah, I would like to ask you. Immediately, the husband is dead, Tara. Like I said, the typical thing a woman will do is to wail. She's in shock and may not even know what to do. How should the woman handle this? Because I hear the most critical time is immediately after the man passes and people take advantage of women at this period. In your case, what did you do? And, you know, I also want you to reference what Christie's husband said and what women need to know. Thank you. Christie's husband is a very wise man because he knows his people. And um, what Christie should do when, if the inevitable happens and when it happens is to follow what her husband said. First of all, move out everything from the house. I know people that, you know, when their husbands died, you know, before the family people came, that same night, their friends got all the cars, all the valuables, all the title documents, moved them out of theirs. In fact, someone was saying yesterday at a program that I was in that it was our husband's elder brother that called and said, you know what, my younger um, siblings are coming to your house now. Your husband's title documents are upstairs somewhere, somewhere. Take them out of the house because they are coming to 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 for the, for those things. So a woman should have trusted friends around her that she can say, you know, this has happened. Please keep this, keep this, keep this for me in safety until I need it. And of course, once a man dies or once somebody dies, crying won't solve the problem. I always tell people, crying won't solve the problem. Once my my husband practically died in my arms. I left him in the hospital, oh. called the oh. uh, uh, siblings, and said, you know what. I'm done. I'm, I'm not the kind of person, I, like I said, I'm pragmatic about that. I'm not the kind of person that will fight over a dead body. I've had him in, in his lifetime. Why will I fight with you over a dead body? What will a dead body do to me? So I, I told them, you know, he's here in the hospital. He's dead, whatever. Please come and stand and take whatever. I'm, I'm done. I'm true. And I drove home. And once I drove home, I ensured that my mind was intact. I knew what I wanted to do. And I started to do all the things I needed to do. So, wailing, crying, it's not going to solve the issues. The first thing that you should be thinking about is, what next? And if you know that you have a, you have a family in-laws like Christie's husband, then you should get yourself 
surrounded with people that you know that even if you can't fight because you're overwhelmed with your emotions, they will fight for you. Tara, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, we're looking at uh, making a will, uh, giving everybody peace of mind. I'm going to come to you later because I want you to really, I want us to talk about is it worth doing a will? Is it not? Because for all my life, I've always um, advocated do a will, do a will. But, you know, we will, we will talk about that later. I'd like to talk to Halima now. So, my friend, Dr. Rukayat from um, uh, Kano. Dr. Rukayat is a lecturer at uh, Bairo University, Kano, and she's also a friend. She was educating me yesterday, and Aisha as well. Aisha is my colleague. They were educating me yesterday. Um, um, and I understand that Muslims are encouraged to write a will. So I'm coming to Halima now. That Muslims are encouraged to write a will. You know, that was really, really reassuring for me to hear that even the Quran advises, encourages to write a will. But that there is also a sharing formula. But that there is a limit to how much one could give out. When I heard that there is a sharing formula, I said at least, <laughs> you know, something goes to the woman, you know, and the children. Even if there are many women there, something goes to them. There is a, the, the, the Quran has prepared um, um, women for, for death. But well, I invited Barista Halima Mohammed, who resides in FCT, to advise better. So, Barista Halima, is it mandatory for every Muslim to write a will to protect his family? And how does it really work? Just guide us. Thank you. Good evening, Tone. Uh, and everybody, thank you for having me on this show. Uh, can you hear me well? We can hear you loud and clear. Naoni. <laughs> in Latvia. <laughs> All right. Uh, in Islamic law, it is encouraged to write a will, especially if you have any outstanding debts and other things that needs to be cleared. But the most important thing under Islamic law is that the law of inheritance or succession has already been made simple and easy by the Holy Quran, by the by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is an allotted share for each and every legal heir. In the Quran, the Quran chapter 4, verses 7 to 14, and verse 176 of the same chapter 4, has given every legal uh, heir his own share. So, um, the, the, but what the Quran says is at the end of every sharing formula, the Quran says after, uh, after the payment of debt and wasiya, that is will. But then under Islamic law, remember you cannot will out more than one third of everything that you have. Because your is your legal heirs are not entitled to to your uh, wasia or will, you cannot will out anything to your legal heirs because it is considered so that you don't uh, do uh, anything unfair or on uh, you don't get unjust to any of your heirs. Your wife, the most we have about twenty five legal heirs or heirs under Islamic law, but. All others will be exempted at the presence of this immediate yes, wife, husband, son, daughter, father, and mother. Once these six people are there, or five most times, because if it is a man that dies, his wife, daughter, son, and uh, mother and father are the only ones that can inherit him under Islamic law. And each of them have their own shares. Where there are children, the woman will get one-eighth of whatever he has. If he is without children, the woman will get one-fourth of whatever he leaves behind. The parents will each get one-sixth. Each of them will get one, one over six of everything he has left behind. And then the children, if there is a male child, Everything that is remaining goes to the children, which shall be shared in the ratio of two is to one. The male heir uh, gets double whatever the woman, the, the, the female heir uh, gets. While uh, in a instant, uh, in instance, and this is non-negotiable insta uh, under Islamic law. This cannot be negated by any will. The ayahs of the Quran takes precedence over every will as long as the death person is a Muslim. 
Wow. And then, um, yes, as long as the deaf person is a Muslim, the Quranic verses, especially in uh, in places where Islamic law is um is uh, is practiced, uh, where in the northern Nigeria mostly we have the Sharia courts. So once you go before the Sharia courts, in short, even the uh, the Supreme Court has made that clear that once you die as a Muslim. Well, we are not talking about tested or intested. Whether there is a will or not, the wordings of the Quran takes precedence. Wordings of the Quran takes precedence. And it must be shared according in accordance with what was given to each heir in the Quran. Hmm. So thank you very much, Doctor 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 Halima. That is really that is really I, I, I yeah, that is that is very very eye opening. So, the wife, the husband, the son, the daughter, the father, and the mother are all. So, you know, we we said um five people because if one is dead, then it's five people. So, what if there are ten sons and twenty daughters? It will it will still be shared accordingly, right? Accordingly, two is to one. The the the, okay. the male child takes double whatever the. Female child, the female child takes two is to one. That is the principle under I can, I can, I can, I can see um, Tao's ears and Esther's ears um, twitching. That um, two is to one. The male takes two, the girl takes one. So that you know, so so that is the way it is. The, the woman can take. It, it's not equal, but at least something goes to her. That's what I'm hearing. It, yes, yes, it is uh, It is not, because the belief under Islamic law is that mm. the man is always the head of the family. The wife would always uh, would get married and would be taking the responsibility of her upbringing. Mm. If she is without a father, if her father dies, and whoever is her eldest brother or her eldest uncle will automatically take responsibility for her feeding and everything. Until she gets married, where her responsibility goes to her husband. So, in his under okay. Islamic law, a woman is never standing on her own. There is okay. a responsibility placed on a, a, a guardian at every point in time to take care of her. So that Thank is you. why that is the that is the rationale behind giving her half of what mm. you give a man. Mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. So as long as you died as a Muslim, the woman is protected, the wife is protected, the, yes, the daughter the is, protected, is protected, the son is protected, according to the sharing formula. This is reassuring. Um, Tara, do you have any comments for um, Barrister Halima? I mean, both of you are legal. Um, legal <laughs> no, 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 okay, fantastic. I, I know that that happens. And also, if you marry under the Act, so... There are provisions on that they act. It's the one third to the wife and two thirds to the children to be shared equally if the man does not um, leave a will. But if he leaves a will, unlike the um, Islamic culture, the will over, overtakes you know, the provisions of the marriage act where it dies in this. Okay. Thank you very much. But this is really reassuring to hear. So my sisters, in uh, my Muslim sisters, are protected. Now, Tara, thank you very much, Halima. Um, um, it's uh, 13 minutes, 13 minutes to 6. I'm um, told talks with Tara, um, and we're looking at uh, having a will, um, uh, especially protecting the woman and the children. I, I, my, uh, so Onyeka sent a message. Onyeka is a woman, by the way. And she said, I concur with you. Women should have properties in their names. Very important. But she now said, what if the woman is not a responsible wife and is likely to blow the man's money? You know, <laughs> what if she's not responsible? You know, and, and, and le le let, me, let me put a twist to this. The family of the man may be thinking like this. They think the woman is not responsible, right? And I'm, I'm doing devil's advocate here. So they may think the woman is not responsible, e even though I don't think it's a business anyway. But they may think the woman is not responsible and he wants to blow the man's money away. And that is what uh, Onyeka is saying. Onyeka is a, is a female. But to get a lover that also comes and wants to blow the man's heart and money away. Yes, that, it happens. It happens. So a yeah. lover comes around, another woman comes around. <laughs> huh? if, if she remarries or something, she remarries. A man that that you know doesn't have as much as a husband, and they live off the husband's money. Oh, it happens. <laughs> so the question you hadn't gotten to the question, you were still. <laughs> 
No, 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 no. She, 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 she just said, you know, she's just making a point that what if the woman is responsible and is likely to give the man's money away? So, how would you advise? Let, let's put it this way: if you, if you're the man's um, friend, a female friend, or you're, you're his sister, how would you handle that, knowing that the wife is frivolous? Because some, some women could be frivolous, really. Definitely. How would you, how would you advise? So, uh, what I would do is that I would make um, a trusted friend, an executor or my family oh, that I know, I will make them executors. So if I know that I have a, I have a um, situation like that, a friend, you know, she has two children, she's doing better than her husband. Her husband isn't um, pulling his weight, hasn't really pulled his weight when it comes to the children, education-wise. And while we were making our will, she said, you know what, I don't want my husband's hands on my money or my pension or anything. So I'm going to make my brother and my lawyer, that's me, executors of my will. And the executors of the will are actually the people that can say do or undo when it comes to the assets of the person. So she, she, she could cut off, she, cut, she invariably just cut off the husband's control and says that, okay, he could, he, we would ask him about, you know, maybe his preference, maybe give him options, you know, as to maybe a school, do you want her to school in this school or in that school? But ultimately, we'll make the control, we'll, we'll, we'll make the decision, and the money does not get into his hands. Thank so you very we, much. We, 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 I'm being told that we have um, about, uh, about nine minutes to go, but I have this question. This is from Zach. Zach, Zach is a man, uh, obviously. He said, if your, if your husband's siblings discover that you're encouraging him to create a will could it lead to a problem might they suspect you of having oh okay might they suspect you of having ulterior motives or even accuse you of plotting harm against your husband if any unfortunate events occurred i hope you understand i mean we've talked right, about well, that how could, how could they know that i was encouraging him to make a will it's because my husband told them mm -hmm. why should my husband tell them so there's oh. some things that are, you know, because he knows me. That's why he's making, he's, we're, we're doing that together. Why must he tell his in-laws, his siblings or his family that I'm encouraging him to make a will? It's a private thing. And like I said earlier on, I don't even have to know the contents of the will. A friend of mine, her husband came to me and he did his will. And I didn't tell her the contents of the will. She's a very, very close friend. I wonder, she said, aren't you going to tell me about what my husband uh, wrote in his will? And I said, no, it's a professional thing. I can't tell you, you know. I, I, the only thing I can, I, can, I can even tell you is that, don't worry, you're well protected. But I can't give you the, the details of the will because it's professional. I have this client confidentiality towards my clients, and I can't tell them. So, you know, if you go and meet in your family and tell them, it's because you want to actually be seen as a bad woman, really. Otherwise, why okay. tell them? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. So now I, I want you to uh, advise on this. I mean, to, I'm going to rule it into two questions because I'm being told that I need to wrap up. The first thing is where the man has died and there was no will and the extended family are denying the wife access to his properties properties that she helped him to build how will she how can she handle this what, what advice would you give to her first thing is and and it's one thing that every woman that her husband has died should know the death certificate is a very important thing. So don't let anybody have the death certificate except you because that's what you're going to use to process letters of administration. So if the husband's family has, uh, are holding on to his property, the first the thing I would advise the wife to is to go to court, apply for letters of administration. If you show that you are his wife and the, the, the law is favorable towards you know giving the woman and um, letters of administration, the wife espousal, letters of administration. Join your child, if your child is of age, or a trusted family member that you know would not um, um, go against your wishes, so to speak, because you have to have two administrators for an estate. And then apply to court. Once you get the letter of administration, don't let them know that you are getting letters of administration, because they're going to now go and put a caveat in the probate registry. So 
don't just do everything correctly. Don't fight with them. Just be looking at them. And then you get the letters of administration. Once you get those letters of administration, they have no authority and you can take them to court. You know. Yeah. Well, so, to so ta ta Tara, it's quite easy to say this, but you know, there, there, there are hundreds and thousands of women who would not even know what to do, but we don't have time. The last yes. question I want to ask you, did you have any fears that the family will meddle? Did you have any fears at all? That your husband's family will meddle when he passed on? No, I didn't. I uh, my, pa my husband's family is they're very uh, English, so to speak. So they keep it themselves, you know. So I didn't have that any fear at all that they will meddle. If I had the fears, then I would have made, I'll have insisted on so much more. But no, I didn't. But I'm not a lot of women are as fortunate as I am. Some even in the marriage don't go in. They can see the meddling. Of the, mm. of the in laws, and that's why when before he dies or when he dies, they must be very proactive. Tara, I'm being asked to wrap up, but please, I would I, we need to do justice to this. Can you please quickly, if you can, in a minute, uh, explain to us the positives and negatives of having a will? Okay, okay. The positive of having a will, a will is a testamentary, testamentary disposition, so you it tells everybody what you would like, you know, and how you like it. You can, you have some sense of control, you know, over what happens when you're, when you are dead, when you're dead and gone. So you can share your property the way you feel you want to share it. You know, that uncle that was nice to you, you can give him some money. That child that was misbehaving, you can cut, you know, cut um, it down. And that's, that's the best thing. You can put in place your affairs helps you to put in place your affairs. But the thing about a will is that it can be contested. And so, you, even though your affairs are in place and in order, someone can come up and say that you are not in the proper frame of mind to have written the will, or that the will wasn't properly um, executed, because there are some rules that must be followed for a will to be properly executed. Another thing about it is that once mm -hmm. you die and it's read, it becomes a public document. So I, for example, can go to the probate registry tomorrow and ask for this certificate copy of a copy of your will and read it just for my leisure, you know, and say, oh, so this was how many properties this man had. And, oh, so he gave this to his young wife. He gave this to the old wife, you know. Okay. Mm. <laughs> that, that uh, and thank you very much. Yes. Tara, yes. thanks thanks very much for sharing. And then last story. thing, sorry, okay. last thing that I must say, a will... You must, even though there's a will down, you must go through letters of probate to, 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 to get that will to be an effective will. And then you have to pay at least 10% of it, of all the assets to the government. That, those are one of the disadvantages of having a will. So, so thank you, Tara. One thing I, I, I picked up earlier is that uh, there are hundred billions of unclaimed monies lying down fallow in the bank when there is no will. Tara, yeah. thank you for sharing with me. Your courage, as I always tell you, is inspiring. Your story tells of the importance of planning today because tomorrow is not assured. Thank you very much, Tara. Thank you. Thank you so um, very much. Um, my pleasure. My pleasure. And you know what I've also picked up is that making a will gives peace of mind to all, especially those closest to the deceased when he is gone. Um, I also want to quickly uh, seize this opportunity to say big thank you to Barrister Halima Mohammed. Thank you for shedding light from the Muslim perspective. What we have done today here is to take away life lessons that when a loved one dies and does not put things in place, bitterness sets in, anger, and sometimes regret. And the people you're supposed to love when you're alive end up not loving at all. I'd like to say thank you to producer Miracle Philip and to Michael, um, Michael A.K. Paul, and to you for doing this with me, thank you. Remember, this is Tone Talks, where we allow life lessons to shape our choices and perspectives, to improve our relationships and make living beautiful. Honest conversations with no constraints. I'm Tone Okewale Shania. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. <laughs>